It is the track Annie by Elastica, and we are very pleased to welcome Justine Freshman to the show. Hello, Justine. Hello, Steve. Uh, you know what always happens to me, because some people have lost track of what you've been up to over the last few years. Barely a month goes past without someone asking me, yeah, have you seen Justine recently? Well, no, strangely, I haven't been through San Francisco over the last year or so. Because uh, you moved to America. When, when did you move to the States? Um, I moved here, I guess, eight years ago. What was the plan? What was the what was the reason? Were you going there to study? Yeah, I went to a place in Colorado uh, called Boulder to study um, to study art. Because uh, after Elastica, well, during the the final period of Elastica, you were already uh, going back to experimenting with art, weren't you? I always loved painting and drawing, and I did that um, even all the way through the band. And it was actually kind of what I always meant to do. Um, music was a bit of um, a kind of sidetrack for me. Yeah. So, so going back to it, I mean, do you find it, I mean, I suppose having been in a band, we'll talk about Elastica in a second, but having been in a band and there's all the politics of what happens day to day with the bands and record labels and things, was it incredibly liberating just going back to being able to paint and draw and ask yourself the questions and then answer them in your art? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think one of the best things and worst things about being in a band is that um, you have to do everything with other people. Um, <laughs> and... Yeah, I mean, it's great to just do what I want and not have to negotiate. You know, it's also, you know, I don't have to um, work with a producer. I don't have to work with a record company, although, you know, there never was a problem working with a record company. But, you know, it's just I'm, I'm very much able to put out into the world, you know, what I want to put out without any kind of... Um, yeah, negotiation is probably the best word for it. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Why, why are you doing this? Do you, do you still keep in touch with music at all? Do you play at all? Is there a guitar in the cupboard under the stairs? <laughs> yeah, I've still got a guitar, and yeah. I do play it. I'm not sort of hugely in touch with what's new. People email me occasionally and say, have you heard this? When, they, when it's something they think I'd really like. You know, someone just emailed me about um, war paint. Yeah. And, um, you know, I heard about the savages through there. But, you know, I hear everything about, I hear about things that are months after probably, you know, people in the UK have heard about them. You see, there's, there's two bands, one, one from America and one from the UK, who certainly are, if you were to draw a line, would trace themselves back, I think, to Elastica. And we should, we should talk about, well, it's 20 years. Do you know it's 20 years ago this month that we broadcast the Elastica session on the evening session, which had Waking Up and Two to One and uh, the track In the City as well, always underrated. <laughs> Always your favourite. One of mine. But the Elastica story, obviously, that starts in sort of 92 going into 93. But for you, it goes even further back, doesn't it? Because you were a member of Suede for a time. I and, was. And when, when you left Suede, did you have a definitive idea of what your new band was going to be? Or did you just have an idea of what you didn't want it to be? I think it was more just having an idea of what I didn't want it to be, yeah. Yeah. Which was, what, too, too serious? Well, you know, I, I just didn't want any guitar solos. And I didn't want any seven-minute songs. So it was a ban on the long song. You've got a short att attention span, I think. A really short attention span. <laughs> so Elastica is... Bought. I see, you see, I'm, obviously I'm biased, but I genuinely think that Elastica are one of the most fondly remembered Britpop bands of this particular era. And you could take them... You could take Elastica out of Britpop and they would still have been a great band. But what, I mean, what, do, you, what do you think it was that attracted people to Elastica? You know, I'm not sure. I think um, we had kind of the coolest people in our band like you know not myself but Donna, Annie and Justin were amazing they were all three of them were like cartoon characters and, <laughs> and I suppose that's the other thing because I don't know how if where, when you first noticed this but have you, as you started touring the country every time every time you went around again there were more and more people who'd started actually replicating the way you looked yeah that was very strange for a while I mean I would look out on a sea of um, kind of mini me and Damon yeah you know, all the boys would have beads on and kind of straggly um, blonde fringes and all the girls had seemed to have dark hair and diagonal haircuts. Yeah. I suppose the other thing about Elastica is you could be which one that you wanted to be because everyone was, you know, sort of so different. But the great thing was, and I think this is really important, I think we talked about this at the time, that there is something brilliant about a band that looks like a gang. Like The Clash looked like a gang and after you, the next band to sort of be the Elastica was The Strokes, looked like a gang. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think a lot of those bands uh, look like gangs. I mean, I think um, Oasis looked like a gang. 
That's true. Uh, listen, we're going to play a track and we'll talk more in a second. It's obviously the, the songs we have to talk about. I mean, I fell in love with, I think Vaseline was the first track on the demo which I ever heard. And those songs on the first album, which were just you know, so urgent and frustrated and just fizzed and spluttered. So we'll go through some of them in a minute. We'll play one of the tracks, though. Uh, there is a story behind this and we'll get to it after you've heard Elastica and Car Song. So it's Car Song by Elastica. You know why I played that, don't you? It's the single that never was. You know, it was a single in America. It was a single in America. You said to me at the time, as every time, this was going to be the single. We should explain that uh, for a while. We were very close because I, I was co-running the record label Deceptive, who put out the Alaska Records in the UK, signed to Geffen in the States, obviously a proper record label. But o- over, <laughs> over, over here, it was going to be, what, it was the argument over what was going to be the single into the release of the album. I said, waking up, you said car song. This debate went on for, you were away on holiday at the time and reversed the charges, as I remember. <laughs> we had these long <laughs> conversations about what was going to be the single. Do you know, later on, about a year later, you said, I'll never forgive you for putting out Waking Up. You know, I did forgive you, it turns out. Oh, OK, I that's that's all right. <laughs> that's, that's OK then. So what do you remember? As we go back, so just before the album comes out, so 90, the, the end of 93 is Stutter era. And then through 94, you did a lot of gigs. I don't know how much, how much you can remember about touring at that point. I remember touring in a minivan and uh, lying on top of all the amps and stuff on our first tour. It felt like, I think for all of us, real, you know, just that thing where if something's about to happen but it hasn't happened yet, it's probably the best. Yeah, it's that thing, I suppose, it's that weird balance between, you know, having a certain people who know about it, but that's, that's always going to change if you, you know, when it becomes more popular. I think as soon as stuff becomes more popular, you get more people who have a problem with you as well. You know, they go hand in hand. Mm. So the early stuff is always really precious because everyone feels like it's really theirs and they've discovered something. And, and I suppose this sort of replicates something that was happening, you know, in the in the 70s because you were a punk rock band in a way, weren't you? And there was this great feeling of just being able to do what you want at the start. You know, it was that like the early days, of, I imagine, how punk was. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I was seven uh, when punk happened the first time. Um, but it definitely it had that flavour of, you know, anything was possible. And, you know, we were signed to you guys, we signed to Perceptive and had a lot of freedom. It wasn't a major record label thing. Um, it just felt like we were, we could do whatever we wanted. And, you know, it did feel like we were badly behaved kids who were getting to jump up and down and shout our heads off every night. And For how long? What, how long was your set at the time? 35 minutes? <laughs> I think it was 22 minutes. <laughs> I was going to dig out. I've got a bootleg of a gig on October the 16th in Leicester, which was my birthday. I remember coming to see you in Leicester, but I didn't have time to check how long the set is. I'll do that at some point. I mean, as well as yourself, so um, what about the other bands uh, at the time? I mean, you had links with two of uh, the biggest bands of the era, Suede and Blur. I mean, they were very important groups, I think, not just to Britpop, but to British pop music in the wider landscape. Do you think that the, the work of Suede and Blur... We were, we were important regardless of whether it was part of a movement. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I never really thought that Suede were Britpop as such. Mm. You know, they, they, were, they stood alone a little bit. You know, they kind of exploded a couple of years ahead of the rest of the Britpop band. Mm. But it was, it, was, it was an interesting time watching the musical sort of pulse came back from the States and came back to Britain. I think we all sort of enjoyed the fact that suddenly we were celebrating something which we understood. Yeah, it was. It definitely felt like a really exciting time, and it also felt like you know we we were the ones that got away. I mean, there'd been lots of really good music for a long time, but it hadn't really crossed over. And you know that obviously had its shadow side, but it it was very exciting as well. And it, it felt like you know we were actually able to you know reach a lot of people and I don't know make an impact. Mm. You know, it, and I know for Damon certainly, he was very conscious of. You know what it meant to be British, and, and it was almost trying to sort of reappropriate. You know what was charming and wonderful about being British. But I guess that then brought its own pressures, didn't it? Because you know, then after you've made that first record and it's been a lot of fun, sooner or later, and you being the member of the band, we had to do all the interviews as well, uh, as well as writing and everything else. There was a lot of pressure when it came to making the second album. Did you feel hemmed in? Um, yeah, I did. You know, I just, I felt like I, you know, I said this in a, an interview and I, I think I actually upset a lot of Elastica fans. You know, I felt like we kind of, we did what we were meant to do after the first album and I should have at that point called it a day. You know, I felt like we had such a good run with that first record and it was a really good first record and 
it kind of stopped being fun um, at, at a certain point during the touring of that first record. It just, you know, for me, it just got too big and um, there was too much pressure. And I, I feel like, you know, I do regret not just walking away from it. I just wasn't brave enough to do that. Which it's at this point as well, so was there something inside you? Are you one of these people that, if it gets to that stage, you want to start breaking it? I'm afraid so, Steve. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be less like that as I, as I get older, but there was definitely a lot of that in me in my 20s. And so looking, looking back at it now, does it, does it look or feel like a completely different life? Like it's almost somebody else's life? It does feel like someone else's life. It's the weirdest thing. You know, when I see um, YouTube stuff of myself, which I occasionally do, and sometimes people send me links to things, and you know, and I'll and I'll start watching, and it, it's the strangest thing. I kind of half remember doing it, or very very vaguely remember, um, and but I can't really relate to the fact that it's me. It's really it's really odd now talking about it because, in a strange way, I think as well we were trying to bring down the bring down the system. I mean, we, well, I only started the record label because. I wanted to bring down the majors and together, you know, it was felt like you were against something. I don't know what it was we were against, but we were definitely against something. We were against something, and I think that's why it's such a shock when things actually get kind of big in their own right, and it's like, oh, isn't this what we were against in the yeah. first place? <laughs> what have we become? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the interesting thing is, the one thing that... this uh, It was an interview from ages ago when we were... Oh, I don't know, we were doing something about diff the different class album, and Jarvis just sort of staring off into the middle distance and saying, actually, for about, I don't know, for about a month... I actually thought it was like the lunatics had taken over the asylum, that we actually, we had got there, you know, we'd like, you know, torn down the doors of the libraries, we'd opened up the industry, and then you sort of look around a month later and you realise, actually, no, they're, they're, they're still there, the people right. who are operating this. And it's just, I suppose that was the other thing which went along with, you know, everything else that was probably beginning to implode. But just, I guess there was a, just a creeping sense of, Disappointment that we weren't running things after. I know all. it's weird, isn't it? It's you know maybe that's just what it's that maybe that's what life's like. You kind of <laughs> you know you just you're always hopeful, and then the thing kind of stabilizes. You know it always goes back to kind of what it was anyway. Yeah, it still makes a difference to people, and um, it's very exciting to have, you know even have that kind of whatever ten minutes of thinking we change things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the thing is you leave behind, you know, a record. That, I mean, it's just astonishing now, obviously, with the availability of stuff online, how many people know the songs. And You know, the weirdest thing happened happened a couple of days ago. I was sitting out on our sort of, you know, on the pavement at the front of our house. And, um, you know, we live in, you know, it's not that far from San Francisco, but it's kind of the backwater. Mm. And our first neighbours, when we first met them, the guy recognised my name because he was a Blur fan. <laughs> right. And... The people at the end of the street, she said to me, she came up to me yesterday, she's like, oh, it's so funny, I had my shuffle on my iPod today and two of your songs came up and I didn't even know she knew who I was. And this is just like in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so so. It, it just proves no matter how far you run, you can't escape. That's right, you can run but you can't hide. <laughs> Indeed. Well, listen, I'm still very, very proud of the records and what you achieved and stood for. So we'll play another track. I'll leave it to you to choose an elastic tra uh, track of your choice. Well, why don't you play Stutter? Yeah, let's finish with that. This, as plotted in, uh, what was it, the pub in Cambridge Circus, can't even remember the name of it, where we did sit down. And I think, I think the conversation went along the lines something like, I want it to sound like Teenage Kicks, but look like White Man in Hammersmith Palais. <laughs> I, I think we pretty much achieved it. Uh, this is Alaska on Six Music, and this is Stutter. And take care, Justin. It's lovely talking to you. Thanks, Steve.